All right, I hope the audio is working. Um, this is the first in the series of the healthcare webinar series by IMX Technologies. Um, our, first, our first webinar is gonna be on EHR basics. Um, we're starting on EHR basics because when you think of health technology, the most ubiquitous one you'll see is EHRs. Um, they're in every doctor's office and hospital uh, in America. So you will see um, this very, very often. Um, so we'll start off with a little bit about Ionix um, and about myself. So um, you can see that Ionix is a technology company. Um, we work in Web3. So Ionix has been working in blockchain is since 2017. Um, now all the blockchain things are called Web3. So um, there's a deep expertise of about five years there. Um, so as all these new things, DAOs and NFTs are all um, coming up, the technology, the background uh, is well understood at Ionix. And we have an expert, uh, Sean Ray, who also uh, works on Web3, uh, including FinTech. That's in, you know, traditional, I guess, Web2 tech. Uh, and then health tech, which we'll be talking about today um, in, in addition to other um other technologies that we do. So, uh, and about myself, um, I am a physician. I worked as a clinical product manager at an EHR company, and um, I do consult with um, a lot of companies as well as institutional investors that are looking to invest in health tech. Um, and for Ionix, I lead the health tech vertical. So um, any, any companies that are doing a healthcare project with Ionix will uh, be able to uh, interact um, directly with B uh, on their projects. So we'll start off pretty basic. Uh, what is an EHR? Uh, an EHR, which stands for electronic health record, is software that creates a digital record of a patient's health information. So what does that mean? Um, well, so uh, for myself, I, I became an expert in EHRs, kind of both working as a physician on EHRs and also um, consulting on them at Accenture. So um, these are some of the basic thoughts um, that are coming and you'll see um, popular examples that you see in hospitals. Um, just give me one second. Um, and popular examples you'll see are Epic, Allscripts, Cerner, uh, and Athena Health. Um, Epic and Allscripts and Cerner you'll see in a lot of inpatient hospitals. And um, you'll see Athena Health in both uh, inpatient, outpatient. Um, and the last thing I'll talk about on what is an EHR, it's kind of EHR versus EMR, because you'll see EMR as well uh, in a lot of places. So EMR stands for Electronic Medical Record. Um, if you Google it, you'll see articles from maybe 10 plus years ago that say that there is a difference, that EMRs are the digital version of a paper chart and EHRs are supposed to do more, like EHR data travels with the patient from facility to facility. Um, but today in 2022, these terms are basically interchangeable. Um, I'll say that EHR is the more modern term. Um, I still come across companies and people who use the more kind of archaic term EMR, but either it's for SEO or um, it's folks who don't work directly in, in the market. Um, and so for the interchangeable uh, data, uh, which we call interoperability, um, so EHR data does not magically travel with the patient facility to facility. Uh, the only exception is if both are using the same EHR say you go to two different hospitals and they both use Epic, then your data will travel from, um, from hospital to hospital. Um, and this isn't a lack of foresight or a technology issue to be solved. Um, there are interoperability standards, but this is more of a business decision to create a walled garden kind of to, you know, have people stuck in a single EHR system. So you don't want um, to, you don't want to give the patients their own data because it's it's better business for the company or the hospital to hold that data for you. 
Um, so let's go into the history of an EHR. So it was actually launched by President George W. Bush. So yes, EHRs did exist before this epic has been around for decades, but um, the, the actual um, start of EHR requirements. So this is that everyone must get an EHR um, started in 2004 and continued all the way into Obama's presidency in 2009 with more laws being passed. Um, and when George W. Bush created the Office of the National Coordinator, ONC, um, so this is for Health Information Technology, and he launched multiple government EHR initiatives. And the quote we're going to examine today is to avoid dangerous medical mistakes, reduce costs, and improve care. So did, did we succeed on these? Uh, we'll, we'll look into those in a bit. Um, so our technology pain. So out of the three that we just mentioned, so is it improved care? So um, clinical notes versus notes for billing. Uh, so notes are very different from what they used to be. Um, and we're going to go into it right now of why it's not just a bad implementation, but it's just a different purpose. So um, previously, we used to have narrative based notes that outlined a patient's history. Um, but nowadays, you will see notes are kind of click heavy templates. And we have other tedious uh, data entry methods that we have today. Um, and the reason that it's like this is that um, writing notes as a doctor, I would write notes if I need to remember this. So I would write it in the patient's chart, or here are some relevant info on this patient for whoever reads it next. Meaning that the purpose of notes used to be transmitting useful information, either from one care provider to another, or to remember for yourself. So I'll give you an example. Um, if my patient had a fever of 101 degrees yesterday, that's Fahrenheit, I would note it down in their chart so that any doctor or nurse can check and they would add a new progress note next to mine or underneath mine the next time they are seen and we will all understand if their fever is trending up or down and if they need additional interventions so that's a an actual clinical note we used to write in the hospital but now if you look at notes they're actually a tool for billing so the things you add in notes are in order to justify uh, hospital billing and you'll see hospital administrators when you join um, at a new hospital, they'll actually teach things like add these six things to your notes and the hospital can make more money. And EHRs actually make it easy to press a few buttons with like smart phrases and it will populate uh, certain phrases that are key for reimbursement. So it, it's almost like hotkeys that will add sentences to your note. Um, and a psychiatrist colleague of mine shared with me that uh, he called it mind numbing, boring, and it has no bearing on patient care. So that's one of the things we have to deal with today. And uh, poor user experience. So um, the end users, which are the clinicians, so um, doctors, nurses, etc., uh, they are not in control of choosing their own software. So um, kind of hospital administrators will choose it based on revenue and monetary reasons. And um, you'll see that the shift was from considering signs and symptoms to thinking about the mechanics of documentation while talking to the patient. So I'm sure people have all been to the hospital or been to the doctor in the last 10 years, 15 years. And you'll see that as you're talking to your doctor, they're almost like treating their computer screen because they have to, they have to write a lot of documentation. Um, otherwise, um, they will be spending about four, a four to five hours at the end of their day documenting all the stuff that they went through or in between uh, appointments. Um, if you're wondering why your doctor's so late, you know, you had a 1045 appointment, it's 1115, you're still in the waiting room. They're probably documenting their previous patient so they don't forget and they don't have uh, gaps in their documentation. Um, and as we talk about poor UX, so EHRs are well behind kind of the user experience revolution we've seen. Um, so, um, and like I said, it's because that the end users clinicians aren't in control of their uh, software. So they use whatever software is chosen at their hospital. Um, and on the note of how much they have to consider kind of the mechanics of documentation, 
There's a quote from Dr. Lloyd, uh, Lloyd Minor, who's the Dean of Stanford University School of Medicine, who said that the most fundamental aspect of human communication, which is eye contact, uh, now is being robbed from the medical encounter because of the electronic health record. So really, as you talk to your doctor, rather than having them look back at you, having them look at the computer screen really, really hurts the, the um, quality of care. And you'll see the time consuming part at the bottom, the time spent at the computer is four and a half hours per day with that's just the doctor's time interacting with their EHR. So all of these are a crushing blow to the quality of care and it's entirely due to the present day demands of EHRs. Uh, so let's look at the second point of what George Bush said when he signed this into law, improved care. Um, have we felt improved care? Uh, so the primary purpose is this billing technology. It is not clinical software. And the reason I keep harping on EHRs being used for billing and not clinical purposes is that EHRs create revenue by increasing the amount of claim revenue that uh, that practices or hospitals are eligible for by documenting every aspect of a patient visit. So there's a saying in insurance, if you didn't document it, it didn't happen. So the level of care of the patient received is actually less important than the documentation of their visit. Uh, Therefore, the technology is optimized for documenting billing rather than documenting to share clinical information. So like my example earlier about the fever, um, that's going to be uh, not, not as important today because you are documenting for billing. So I'm going to give another example about um, documenting for billing now. So medical billing is very complicated. Probably need an entire webinar episode on just that. So without getting into the minutia of it, when you visit your doctor in their office, generally you'll be uh, billed with a CPT code. Um, and I'm gonna use the new patient office visit as an example. So um, there's about five of those that are increasing in complexity and the more complex, the more you get paid. So um, they're all called new patient office visit, but you can have, uh, it goes from 992, uh, 202 to 99205. So 99202 is straightforward, 203 is moderate, and then 205 is complex and complicated. So even though I'm seeing a new patient, there's multiple ways I can send that bill. And if I say it's complex and complicated, I can get three times the revenue than if I say it's um, straightforward. So um, you can see why practices and hospitals will want you to bill on the higher side to um, say that my new patient office visits are pretty complicated because there's a there's a large financial benefit to saying this so so doctors are trained to spend time documenting and justifying the need for more complex and lucrative codes in their ehr rather than um, kind of working on it for the patient um, and uh, one more thing that EHRs do well is scheduling. So um, scheduling again is is somewhat tied to revenue because the better you are at scheduling, the more patients you can get in. Um, there are companies that do exclusively um, work on scheduling patients or on outreach, sending text messages and things like that to patients for reminders, making sure that they come in because every missed appointment is again, missed revenue opportunity. Um, and a lot of that is built right into the EHR as well. And um, the next thing is that we're going to talk about fee for service versus quality based care. So um, one thing that I'll say is that so when you when you do have a patient visit uh, scheduled, um, it's really in the fee for service model where the patient will pay a fee, for example, even a $50 copay, and the doctor is paid a set amount for their service of seeing the patient. So the fee they pay, the services they get seen by the doctor. Um, and that's how it works today. Um, there, there are quality-based care initiatives. And I've seen these, again, for 10 years at least, um, while I've been working in healthcare. Um, the idea behind this is great, is that hospitals get paid on the quality of service they provide, not just on the number of patients seen. Um, while it's really good in theory, um, in practice, I feel like they've largely flopped as it really just adds an additional layer on top of the current fee-for-service pay scale rather than replacing them. Um, 
there's a lot of examples of these PQRS HEDIS and things like that. But so this kind of says, not only are you going to have to document additional stuff for the quality of care and annually you need to update these things and there's all kind of measures you're looking at, but the fee for service model still exists below that. So I get paid at the time I see the patient and, you know, based on a bunch of different things, maybe I'll also get an additional reimbursement for the quality of care I provided um, is, is the way it, it, it looks today. Um, ideally we would be, solely on the quality-based care, but um, we're definitely not there today. Um, and, and the last thing of the three is avoiding dangerous medical mistakes. So are EHRs helping us avoid these dangerous medical mistakes? Um, the, the Journal of American Medic, uh, the Journal of the Ameri American Medical Association, excuse me, JAMA, um, said that EHRs didn't detect up to 33% of medical errors. Um, so, you know, if we sacrifice the quality of care to increase safety, it might be, um, you know, we might be able to say that it's all worth it, but even it looks like we haven't really seen an, um, an increase in safety. So uh, this JAMA article was, um, examining EHR trends for safety over, over 10 years with, with researchers at the University of Utah Health. Harvard University and Brigham and Women's Hospital, and um, th and these were done in in study simulations, so there was no patient harm done. But the EHRs were not able to detect, like I said, thirty three percent. And then we'll see alert fatigue. So um, one of the examples um, of a feature of EHRs is to issue warnings. So these warnings um, are trying to avoid dangerous medical mistakes, right? So. An example is um, allergic reaction. So if I say my patient's allergic to eggs and I have an egg-based immunization, I'm going to give them, it should pop up and say, hey, these guys, this guy's allergic to this. Or if they have a penicillin allergy and it's documented, and when I try to um, give a penicillin, it will um, tell me for an allergic reaction alert. Uh, they also have drug-drug interactions, excessive dose, et cetera, a lot of different um, alerts. So um, this should theoretically reduce errors and improve patient safety. But the problem is that um, if you see the majority of them were overridden, 73% of the alerts are, are basically ignored or the doctor says oh, this isn't relevant. So if you could imagine almost three out of every four alerts are useless, um, it's, it becomes alert fatigue. It becomes um, just kind of more of a chore than um, you know something to to um, really worry about patient care. And um, this, uh, let's see, let me go here. And so the last thing on this page is about drug databases. So drug databases, um, there's a lot of um, different services. You can see like First Data Bank is one, FDB, and they have an extensive list of every single possible interaction and they are supplying that to the EHR. Uh, but what, what I, what I see is that EHR companies don't want to, to pare that down. They don't want to um, basically make it, make it easier for clinicians to use and kind of block out some of these useless um, pop-ups or, the, or what they know is going to be overridden anyways. Um, they, they instead push every single possible notification and they force the doctor to override them. So EHR companies can claim they're erring on the side of caution. It actually costs them less work. Um, but I believe in reality, they're actually afraid of the liability of failing to display these interactions. And EHR companies lack the clinical expertise or the advisory to make changes to improve usability for doctors. So um, we'll go into it at the end, but that's one thing that Ionics can help with. It is that um, you know we have the clinical expertise to uh, really improve the usability for doctors to safely remove some of these alerts um, and things like that. And and um, it's not a flaw in system design because every single EHR has that. Um, because when, when we talk about interactions, um, yes, there may technically be an interaction, but a lot of them aren't significant. And doctors have seen them a lot. Um, and the most common reason given for overriding, because when you override an alert, you must give a reason. The most common was will monitor or patient has tolerated before. So, um, and here we also have that 
when, when systems suggested an age-based medication substitution. So if I prescribe something for, um, my, for my patient and the system could look at their birthday and say that this is a pediatric patient, um, they will, or, or the system can suggest an age-based medication substitution. Um, but again, that's only appropriate, you know, a quarter of the time. So there's lots of improvement, um, lots of room for improvement and optimization. Um, and yeah, um, how we can help is really, um, you know, software for medical devices is something that we've done. Um, and refining clinical workflows, I just talked about that as well. Um, we're able to, you know, optimize a lot of those, those alerts, remove some unnecessary things. Um, e-prescribing and prescribing optimization and development. Um, I worked on that as well. And um, we can we can remove a lot of those alerts or we can optimize it for a clinician workflow. Um, and when I put a refined clinical workflows, you see clinical UX. So um, I mentioned earlier that the user experience for clinicians and EHRs is um, very much an afterthought um, because again, they are primarily for billing and the clinical features are other um, almost nice to have um, outside of marketing um, but you really want to make it easier on doctors um, there's a lot of burnout a lot of you know like imagine four and a half hours a day of documentation uh, in addition to seeing patients uh, that's pretty uh, pretty difficult um, and technical review of ehr software um, this is for companies that have a lot of different databases um, and they're looking to simplify um, then we, interoperability standards such as HL7 and FHIR. Um, these are newer things. Um, FHIR has been around for several, um, for several years. There's been requirements that the government put out in order to um, make those uh, mandatory or to adopt those. And um, we're also able to help with that. Um, and then custom technology builds. So this is kind of the the bread and butter of Ionix, which is what they've been doing for a long time. Um, so this is for digital health and apps, and we've also definitely um, done this before. And finally, really um, what we can do is be the technology partner for health tech. Um, any company that works with Ionix is able to um, get, get time with me as well. So um, I'll definitely uh, be involved in every health tech project um, at some level. So. Uh, feel free to get in touch uh, with me directly. Uh, you can email me or message me on Telegram um, or LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, let's see, do we have any questions or comments? Let's see, we have one from Saranya. Do Web3 technologies have any role to play in cutting down the complexity of EHR systems? Um, I think Web3 technologies have some um, theoretical uh, role to play in that we could see, um, like a lot of other industries, when people say they, they can use Web3 in order to allow people to own their data and things like that. Um, yes, theoretically, we could have that. Um, but right now, I would say that even, even amongst Web2 companies, we are... Um, we are seeing there's only a few players and they're holding on to the data for dear life. It's like, what's what's most valuable is the data. So Web3, I think it, it would be great if we're able to um, see which which ones are, are going to um, put kind of the power back into the patient's hands and see what they can do. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful Web3 can do something um, and we'll see how that goes. Oh, uh, we have another one. Uh, in your opinion, which EHRs have really good user experience? Um, there's there's a famous video by Dr. Zubin Demania where he talks about how each, every EHR is pretty bad and which is actually good for the EHR companies as well because if they all are bad, nobody has to improve. Um, so I think, um, that would be one that, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I don't know which one has good user experience. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I feel like 
they all don't have good user experience. Um, Athena Health gets credit from uh, from Doctor Demania at least for admitting that they have bad user experience, um, but the rest just kind of um, almost act like they they're doing just fine, I guess. Uh, but yeah, user experience isn't great at, at any EHR. Uh, one from Hamani. Uh, in a typical OP visit, does the complexity of EHR systems hinder a physician from giving undivided attention to their patients? How can Annex help? Um, yeah, I think it's not really the complexity. It's just the the amount of required documentation. Again, like it's not like it's difficult. Um, yes, you know the uh, the the user experience doesn't make it any easier. Um, you know, there's a lot of clicking around. There's you know, like I said, you're you're no longer taking a narrative note, which is like, you know, oh, like um, five months ago, it started on my left side and da -da -da, like, you know, you get that kind of story based um, patient history where now it's like um, I will have to click on head and then head will break out to like left, right. And then I'll have to click on left and then another arrow will pop up and it'll say this. So you're kind of like you're clicking together this sentence rather than um, kind of speaking it or writing it as they say it or, or kind of having a conversation with the patient. Uh, with the patient. So um, how can Ionix help? Yeah, I mean, um, in the user experience side, uh, we have a really great design team uh, led by uh, Chippy. And yeah, if we're able to get in there, I mean, uh, first thing is that, um, like I said, only one company has really admitted that they have poor UX um, and the rest don't seem too interested in improving it. So um, if a company really does want to go and improve their user experience for clinicians, you know, we have a clinician and we also have great design team that we can uh, customize those workflows, um, you know, really talk to the physicians at that practice or hospital and understand what they need customized um, specifically for them and then create workflows and create the user experience, the clinical user experience um, that they're looking for. All right, I think there's no more questions. So uh, that was our first episode. Um, we will be back and um, we'll have our second episode on the health tech series. All right, uh, thanks everyone.